the most recent was the uh, arson of the caveman. Um, in that incident, we had really one person um, thought it would be funny to put a flare in the caveman's mouth like a cigar. Um, this was on the evening of the 4th of July and just didn't have anything else to do. Um, of course, once they got up there, they found out that you couldn't put anything in the mouth, and so they just set the flare on the foot, um, which then, of course, started the fire and, and caused the extensive damage to the caveman, requiring them to take it down and, and repair it. Um, that person uh, was 17 at the time. He turned 18 on the, on the uh, 5th of July. So really, he'll be charged as an adult. He was uh, arrested and lodged in the uh, adult jail. The charges against him are felonies, and uh, now he's gonna have a felony record for really just uh, an act of recklessness that I'm sure, you know, and he didn't really realize it at the time. Um, he's been in some prior trouble, but, uh, and just got out of, you know, some problems that he'd been having, and uh, then he went ahead and did something like this. Again, just, just kind of, uh, reckless act that uh, really didn't gain anything, there really no reason for it. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I feel it's a real shame that somebody torched it. Uh, unfortunately, our society is kind of failing us, our judicial system is failing us because there, there's no longer penalties for somebody that doesn't care if they go to jail or doesn't have anything to take. If you don't have anything to threaten them with or to punish them with, then you, they have actually, at that point, they have no laws. So unfortunately, there's, there's really not much you can do in retribution to somebody who does this, so that they're gonna continue to do it. The caveman, for example, even though it's still in the process of going to court, et cetera, um, we will probably be looking at posing the $5,000 fine to that individual. Um, along with fines, uh, it's the cost of repairs to property damage or uh, injury to people. Uh, not only the firefighters that respond, but medical people, uh, bystanders, etc. All that has a, a value to it in which that individual is personally responsible for. The individuals being minors fall back to the parents. So, It's kind of difficult to recreate something when it has been burnt so severely. It's actually easier to, for me to rebuild, to make him from scratch than it is to reconstruct his face and bring him back the way he was in 1971. Why is that? The reason why that is is because after a fire, you're losing probably seven to 12 layers of glass and like on his face portion the day that we got him in here i laid my hand on his face and my hand went through his face that was a very bad burnt spot right now uh, is you wet all the material down right here which is fiberglass that has been severely burnt the reason why i wet it down with resin is uh, for i'll be able to grind it and make it smooth again after that process I will be taking fiberglass matting, which is this stuff right here, and you lay it over him and you will be resonating him. And after that process, then you gotta re-grind him, smooth him down, and then I will be applying more gel coat over top of him. And when, on the caveman, when I go to grind him, there's a lot of fibers in the air. Um, and after I get him all grind down and he's nice and smooth and everything, what I will be doing then is I will be gel coating him and putting another layer of resin on there and building up a nice smooth surface. And then after that I will be highlighting him with airbrushes and so on. And what the final step that I will be doing on the caveman is putting the fire retardant material on him and hopefully no other arsons will be attempted to light him on fire. We got to come up with things for our youth to have something to do in this community. There is nowhere for them to hang out. 
for younger generation 10 years from now what is this development around here what is it going to be like then everybody is blaming the child when the parents need to look in the mirror at themselves and try to figure out how we can come up with things for our children to do there's so many budget cuts and everything like that well we can't budget cut our children anymore we've done enough it's time to start figuring out how we can help them get them into fishing hiking doing things that people need to get back into doing yeah. <laughs> well, I think he's doing a great job. I think it's a huge improvement from the way it was before. Um, I've lived in Grants Pass since 1976, and that caveman had been standing since I moved here. It represents the high school, the cavemen. Uh, it has a lot of history behind it. Even though times have changed, I think it's still a symbol of Grants Pass. It's the climate. <laughs> well, we talk about the caveman, whether we want it back up as our image for people coming into town. The other day, a grandmother had her seven, eight-year-old granddaughter came here up to Ballinger Industrial Park because she had read in the paper about the caveman being here, and her granddaughter was from Turlock, California. And her granddaughter, every time she came up here, was taken to see the caveman standing at the north end of town. And this little girl did not want to go back to Kerlock, California until her grandmother took her up to show her the caveman where he was, where he was burnt, and being fixed at. So I believe that people do know that this is our image and our stuff, not Cave Junction, but Grants Pass is the caveman. My son played football here. We are known as the caveman. My son went on to Lewis and Clark and played football there as a captain. He was known to come from Grants Pass being a caveman. He went to Europe and played in Vienna, Austria for the Vienna Vikings for a year. He was known as coming from Grants Pass and being a Grants Pass caveman. I hugged him and kissed him while he was laying here so that the next time when he sat back up at the north end of town and I come into town I can say I hugged and kissed the caveman and I'll never be able to do that again. Born and raised in Grants Pass in 1971 when the caveman was put um, up the north end of town. I was in junior high at North Middle School. I know my friends and I kind of thought that he was kind of a burly looking caveman because I was very accustomed to the caveman pride um, being from parents that graduated from Grants Pass High School as well. Um, we we're very prideful and so but the bottom line is he was an icon for our community. I've spoken with a lot of folks about the caveman and whether they should put it back up on the on the hillside or not. Yeah. And I've got a lot of mixed emotions from, from folks. Some people are all for it. It's a tradition. It's been there for a long time. And some folks, on the other hand, are just as happy to get rid of it. Um, I think in today's generation, it's a throwaway society. That thing's damaged. Um, why should we keep it? But on the other hand, it is a tradition, and it's been here since the early 70s, if I, I remember correctly. I think everybody has their own opinions. You know, my opinion is not really based on, you know, in business, you know, and anyone up in this business. When somebody says, that's how we did it in the past, that's not what I want. I want change. Change stays up in the environment, and that's what you want to do. So as a customer walks in, you give them more than they expect when they walk in the door. That change is going to be in all companies, and that change is good for society and it's good for our community. However, history is history. And the caveman sign has been here a long time, and the caveman sign was put in based on the tradition. So you're not talking about something that, wow, it's just so old, we should change it. You're talking about a community said, we are going to establish ourselves as a caveman and we're going to make a big statue, whoever did that, that probably should stay. My roots go deep in this community. My grandfather, Pete Lockridge, was county commissioner. I give our town the same respect that my grandfather gave our town. I support the caveman. I feel the caveman is a symbol of all that is great in our community. Is, uh, is a community mascot and it's like many communities or places across the country uh, you choose a mascot. It's a mascot for our Grants Pass High School caveman and we also have lady cavers uh, by the way as well. 
and uh, it's also a promotion for tourism in the Oregon Caves. And as you know, Josephine County is part of the Redwood Empire Association, so we try to attract tourists there, and the caves are part of that. So the whole caveman thing, the whole mascot thing, is part of the history and legacy of our community. And I think in many respects has been a positive influence. So as we move into the future, I, you know, that uh, mascot will continue to uh, serve our community in a productive fashion. And I'm intimately familiar with the caveman uh, statue that's right behind my window here. In fact, uh, when I look out my window, it looks at his tush. So uh, I'm very familiar with the caveman statue. It was uh, put here in 1971, and uh, apparently there was a sister or a brother made of the caveman statue, which is now in Missouri someplace uh, at a caves in uh, Missouri. So there was an actual twin or a double that was made. I have a book here that tells of uh, some of the uh, caveman historical dates and things that have happened with the caveman club. The Oregon Caves was actually discovered in 1874 by Elijah Davidson. And then uh, in 1909, the U.S. government declared the Oregon Caves a national monument. Well, some of the merchants and folks uh, with the Chamber of Commerce back in 1922 were looking for uh, a tourism gimmick to try to bring people to Grants Pass, Josephine County, and uh, Cave Junction area. Some of the uh, antics that the cavemen do is they capture people and they induct them into uh, the caveman club. Some of those inducted in 1924, Babe Ruth was inducted uh, as an Oregon caveman. And in 1932, Herbert Hoover, who was president at that time. And then Shirley Temple in 1936. Jack Dempsey, the boxer in 1942. Brigadier General Billy Mitchell in 1946. And it just goes on and on and on. In 1968, uh, Senator Robert Kennedy was inducted into the caveman and uh, Ronald Reagan in 1977. So it just keeps going, and the cavemen have been famous over the years for uh, doing those types of antics. Come on up. Okay. We're on the front porch of the uh, Schmidt House. Uh, the Schmidt House was a residence uh, owned last by the Schmidt sisters uh, in Grants Pass. They donated it to the Josephine County Historical Society in uh, 1987. The house was built in 1900 out of local made brick uh, at the Wolfolk Brickyard. One of the things I like uh, about uh, interviewing one of the Wolfolks a few years ago was the fact that he told me that uh, if you look at these bricks, how crude they are. Uh, he told me it's not, it's not any wonder. He said my dad got a big kick out of the fact that when he sold those bricks to old man Schmidt, he said they were all seconds. And of course, you know, there never was a caveman that ever lived in the Oregon Caves. None ever set foot. That's known fact. There were, there were some prehistoric animals in there, but uh, small ones. Probably the, 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 the fundamental reason for the caveman was a spin-off of the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, one early day in the in, in early month of, of 1922, right over on this corner over here on K Street, where you'll see the, the um, tire shop, stood a hotel called the Oxford. It was removed in 1965. The name had changed to the Del Rogue at that time. But uh, anyway, at, uh, during a luncheon, why a few of the uh, Chamber of Commerce people, about four people actually, decided that they would uh, put some wigs on that they got a hold of and some furs, and they came to the luncheon that was being held over there and, and uh, started proclaiming that they were the Oregon cavemen and that they held domain over Josephine County and, and, um, and all, all that the county, county represented. And uh, the chamber just got a big kick out of that. And they thought, what a wonderful idea. What a wonderful idea. So they immediately put it into place. 
and uh, <coughs> formed a, a corporation called the Oregon Cavemen Incorporated uh, and later in 1922 <coughs> they were a zany bunch of people wearing their Neanderthal smiles and, and uh, scowls rather and uh, they would just do anything they would go anywhere any place and so uh, one of the things that they did was uh, uh, during the 30s, I think I believe it was the early 30s, they went back to New York and they just jumped up on the stage of the Broadway musical called Hell's a Poppin', which was a pretty big musical in those days, and just completely broke the place up. It was just never heard of for any, anybody to do such a thing. And so uh, they gained recognition, and in their heyday, uh, in the 20s and 30s, and probably by the 40s, why about one out of every 10 persons in the United States, according to Deb Spots, uh, knew the name Oregon Caveman. The other zany things that they did, and this was in the 30s, was that um, Shirley Temple had been threatened. Uh, her life had been threatened. And uh, so they were getting away from Hollywood, the, her mother and, and her, and they were coming up through Oregon. And of course it was known that they were, which route they were taking. And, and the Oregon caveman at that time jumped out onto the road and stopped them and just scared the daylights out of her. I mean, it wasn't really too funny after it happened, but just scared her to death. And so uh, anyway, she later posed for, uh, for a picture with uh, Chief Bighorn and, of the Oregon caveman. In 1937, with the dedication of the Golden Gate Bridge, the Oregon cavemen were on hand with their, their crude implements that they used for measuring things, and they held up the ceremonies while they got out there on their hands and knees and, and measured the bridge and everything before they would let it go, you know, let it, allow it to be opened officially. It had to put their stamp of approval on it. And so uh, there was a wedding in the Oregon Caves conducted by the, you know, the cavemen were there on hand and what have you. The only wedding ever held in a cave that cave anyway and uh, oh they were just a zany bunch of people I can remember in about 1970 my mother signed us up um, or signed me up for baton lessons through the parks and recreation and it was um, called the cavettes as it grew um, started marching in the parades our uniform was a cave outfit which was one armed, you know, with the caveman or cave material with gold um, sequins that ran along it. Also, a group of us, a group of five of us, um, took it a little further and formed uh, a little team that we went up to Roseburg, Portland, Salem areas and actually entered competitions um, for twirling. Won lots of trophies. This was what I looked like 40. Two years ago, and this is what I look like. <laughs> cave queen was that the cave queen? Outfit? Forty years ago, what yeah. Was it, um, it was rabbit fur. This was a princess's outfit because it has multicolors on it. The cave queen was only one that wore all white. Oh. It was a tradition, and we had old tennis shoes that were covered with fur. And uh, the original one that I got, what uh, was just the raw hide, the raw rabbit, <laughs> leather inside and rough, and we wore bathing suits underneath, and we were requested to wear one-piece bathing suits because you wanted to keep it all together because you did a lot of antics in the parade. And we'd just go off on uh, different ventures with the cavemen. Uh, the women uh, that went with us were the wives of the cavemen, and they just, uh, they took a lot of pictures. This was when I, uh, the picture, this is my senior high school graduation picture that I sent in to them. And then the news clippings of all the girls that were uh, applying for the position. And we had a little controversy over it as it was being a lottery because we were selling pins to a uh, dollar a piece and the person that sold the most pins got to be the cave queen. Mm -hmm. And the district attorney said, that's a lottery. Lotteries are illegal in the state of Oregon. You can't do that anymore. So the first time I was cave queen, I won because I sold more than anybody else. And the second time I was cave queen was they just took all the girls' names, put them in a basket, and they drew mine out. <laughs> and it was two years apart, 62 and 64. So I was with the cavemen for about four years. I did it 62 as queen, and then 63 as a fill-in when they needed an extra princess, and 64 as queen, and then 65 as uh, a fill-in. And by that time, 
I was getting old and decrepit, you know, I was 22. <laughs> uh, and they liked the, uh, the young ones. And, uh, you know, the, and they had these little uh, flyers that they handed out to people in the parade, pictures of everything. And when the freeway opened, I got to open the freeway. And I think this is kind of interesting for people who think that, oh, this is so childish. Or what were the caveman doing? We have the, you know, the governor of Oregon, the people uh, head of the state highway transportation from Salem and all, and right here is a picture of me, and here's Mark Hatfield, the governor, oh, yeah. with the big uh, Chief Bighorn. So a uh, lot of the state, uh, a lot of state officials and federal officials were uh, introduced to the cavemen by them showing up, mm -hmm. and then uh, were um, initiated into the cavemen, and they had to drink the blood of the saber-toothed tiger, which was usually uh, like a Bloody Mary, it, uh, and, and it was and it was real strong so it wasn't uh, bad tasting but when they they take a drink of that and they thought they were going to get a sip of tomato juice and it had a little alcohol in it, it did. frequently <laughs> oh don't believe it i was very slim at one time there <laughs> i enjoyed to yes <laughs> this is uh me and uh the newest queen when we were over at the Rhododendron Festival. And then another thing I thought was really cute was we went to Reno once, and a lot of the times the guys would go to a meat packing house if there was nearby and get a big bloody bone from a big, you know, big mm -hmm. cow bone. Mm -hmm. And they had this great big one once, about this big around, and about this one. And he was carrying it down the street of Reno, and he was walking up, and some guy had this police dog on a leash, and he put the bone down, and the dog went, mine! <laughs> And the dog latched onto that bone, and here's the caveman pulling and the dog pulling, the caveman pulling and the dog pulling. And I don't really remember who won. It was just kind of like he took the trouble to go get that bone, and that dog was going to say, this is my bone. You can't have it. <laughs> so it was really kind of interesting. <laughs> the, That's me. cute. And his dyke Potts, Deb Potts' Deb's brother. Yeah. Oh. And... Hmm. Uh, Oh, there's the big clubs. Yeah, big, uh, this is was a root of a tree, uh -huh. oh. and uh, made into it. And, and this was just a, a lot of the, them had uh, clubs of wood that was malformed and just uh -huh. was very interesting. They cut it out and polished it up. And cave women do not growl. Okay, what do they do? We are just very polite. We were, one of the main things that the cave women did or cave girls, as we were called it, princesses at that time, is we would go along with candy, and we would calm the kids whose mothers had been taken and tossed in the cage, because a lot of them were just screaming, because they, little kids, thought it was real, that they were never going to see mommy again. And, uh, and so we would go along, and we would uh, calm them and give them candy, and tell them, the tell, the tell them that everything was okay. And sometimes we'd even take the kids and run up to the cart with them and get, say, we need this kid's mother back now, <laughs> and get the mother out, and she'd take the, pick up the kid and go back Here to watch. We have the some of the Arabs, the people that recommend uh, that represented um, Winnemucca, High Desert. Arabs, you know. Hmm. So they have, their booster group was the Winnemucca Arabs, and it's, oh. you know, Crescent City had Arabs too because it was the end, so you, from Winnemucca to Crescent City, <laughs> the two organizations, the, uh, and then Grants Pass Cayman, and then uh, the uh, Coos Bay Pirates, all different organizations had their own and little... And they were all uh, businessmen? Businessmen who would go out mm -hmm. to cities around, mm -hmm. sometimes some distance from their city, to boost their city, say, come visit us, we're right. a good tourist place, yeah. come and see us. And when Grants Pass kind of came into its own in that we had people came for years to fish, like Clark Gable used to come and say, stay at We Ask You In and mm -hmm. fish. Mm -hmm. But when the boat trips opened up and the freeway opened up, in the 60s, mm -hmm. you know, more people just normally could get here better. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the cavemen, uh, there's a lot of people, 
uh, just kind of thought it was silly, I guess, and didn't join. And so you can't keep an organization going when you have 75-year-old men running around in animal furs. <laughs> you need to have your Younger. you need to have your 35, 40-year-old ones. You don't want your you don't want your post-teen 20-year-olds. You don't want them <laughs> for obvious reasons. <laughs> you know, so it's kind of an interesting. Uh, scenario that it was a really a big deal for a long time. In 1970 I went to the county commissioners and uh, got their okay to set up a statue up here on the corner and uh, try to you know maintain this area and, and develop it a little bit. So they gave us permission to do it and then of course we built the uh, pedestal and then we set the caveman up in 1971 on Labor Day. No, pardon me, Memorial Day uh, in, in 71. And that was in congestion with, with the, uh, the Grants Pass Parade. Oh. We done it in the morning and then we went into the parade in the afternoon or about 10 o'clock. So uh, that's how he come about. And now how did, who made it? Uh, International Fiberglass Company out of Venice, California. We send everything down to them. They uh, develop the mold. They send us the mold back, and we approved it. Sent the mold to them, and then they made the, the 15 and a half foot caveman out of it. All of us uh, kind of we got kind of got pictures together of everybody in different poses, back, front, and whatever have you. And this is the one they come up with of four or five of the cavemen that pose for him, or you know, yeah. sent our pictures in. And this thing here is another one was done yes. by somebody. Okay. Well, this this was designed by uh, or drew up by uh, a man in Eugene, Eugene, Oregon, and of course he wanted to build this thing 40 feet high. 40 feet. 40 feet. He wanted to set this thing up here. Yeah. Now, in, how, in how, the air. how tall is the caveman that you guys finally? Well, set up? he's he's 15 and a half feet. The one you have settled on. Right. Now with the pedestal, how high is he? Well, he's, uh, the pedestal is eight foot, so he, he's 23 and a half feet high. Oh, okay. So this guy would have been a huge Yes, monster. and you know, he'd be so huge that nobody could get a picture of him standing right up close to him. And it just says that they are an honorary member of the Oregon Cavemen. And this one is your native bunny. Yes. So she must have been a playboy or playboy? Uh, in there, yeah, in one of them. And she, we call her Native Bunny. And uh, that's Terry, uh, Terry Smith. And she's uh, from Grants Pass originally. And of course, I don't know where she is now. She may be in Grants Pass. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this, uh, this horns here we use for people that we have uh, initiated in the past, like ex-presidents and ex-presidents and if they happen to come back to town well we get them again and then we make them wear this in the ceremony and everything uh, as ex-dignitaries. So this is a special headdress? This is a headdress for, yeah, special. Special dignitary. Right. You know, our other one has got great big horns and for the for the chief. Okay. Now, tell me about the ritual that these guys would go through. Okay, well, Here's uh, Teddy again, and what she's doing now, she's uh, drinking some saber tooth tiger blood. She's drinking out of the hind end of a skunk. And here's our little boy right here that we make him drink it out of. Oh, okay. Show the audience uh, what's in, uh, so they, how do you do that? Well, of course, it's, we call him a little stinky skunk, you know. Uh -huh. And of course, when we make him drink it, we kind of just open it up and then put this up to him like this with you know the tail end going up going up to it okay show the audience the back end of the skunk here with the tail up okay so it's a little bottle uh, like it, a little, little oh yeah it's just a little bottle and uh, yeah. it's with some type of juice in it it depends on who it is and everything else it could be a, a little mix in there or, you know or a little hot hot sauce and stuff stuff like that okay. and of course we give them to give them this after we feed them the meat of the meat of the dinosaur, you know, we make a meat, raw meat. Now what is the meat of the dinosaur? What is that all? Is that steak or something? Well, yeah, yeah, it's steak, but we, we call it roadkill. We tell them, well, of course, you know, we uh, uh, just picked him up off the road down, down the street. <laughs> but it, basically, it's good meat. 
and steak and what have you, you know, right out of the butcher shop. Yeah. You know, something like that. And, well, this right, this right here is our skins we wear in the parades, and uh, that's how we dress right there. These are made out of bobcat, uh, uh, coyote skins, and what have you. Uh, this particular suit's probably uh, about 60 years old. This one right this here. This one suit itself. Yes, I've had this myself for uh, probably 40 plus years. Now, did you inherit this from another guy? Yes. Yeah, they were all passed pass, pass downs, you know. Well, yeah, it's just a pair of boots that, or shoes that you wear, and they're, they're lined with skin, same skin. Mm -hmm. uh, now, do you have these made specially for yourself? Yes, yeah, the, you got to have the right, right type. And, of course, this here is the, uh, my hairdress when, I, when I'm not wearing the... When you not have your hairdress. Oh, okay, this, right. is, this is your... Uh, toupee wig, whatever. Right. Now, what's that made out of? Well, it's just horse hair, and uh -huh. uh, that's about it. Of course, this here is my ex chief uh, club. And you carry that around mm -hmm. as, a, as yes. some people that you're the boss. Right. Now, ex chief, uh, uh, the in year. 1970. 1970, huh? yes. Okay. Grab a hold of that thing like you mean business with it. Well, you just carry it around, whatever. And of course, this here, we call this a, a woman grabber. You know, you get it around the neck and. Hold it right, told you. Yeah. Okay, let me yeah. look at that. That's a woman grabber right there? Yeah. You, you hook her right there and just pull it right toward you. Right. And then that woman better be screaming and yelling. Yes, that normally is, yeah. <laughs> a very interesting memento. Back in 1967, Grants Pass was building a new naval reserve facility out by the airport. And uh, my then husband was commander of that unit. And so we were to have a ceremony to basically break ground and, and we brought dignitaries out there to the site and two admirals were brought down from Whidbey Island in Washington State to do the necessary honors for the Navy and of course the cavemen were there and the cavemen approached the two admirals asked them to drink the blood and, and, and do all the things. They immediately took two steps backward and said no, that they were not going to do this, which uh, uh, resulted in some consternation from the local folks and from the caveman. And finally, one of the admirals said, I will do it if Ruth will do it. <laughs> And so the caveman looked at me, the naval personnel looked at me, and I said, yes, I will. <laughs> Having heard all the stories that, that went on about this, and so I did it, they did it. The Navy was happy, the government was happy, local folks were happy, and we went from there. But in a very few days, I received a letter and a card from the cavemen um, telling me that I was the first local woman to ever be issued a cave woman card. And so it was appropriately framed and holds a place of honor <laughs> in my home. the caveman uh, and now I, I'm a big fan and uh, I feel like uh, he is uh, a part of this high school uh, a part that uh, is known certainly statewide and 
and even nationally. There are not very many high schools that have a unique mascot, nickname like the caveman, and uh, he's special. Well, he's all done and he's ready to be put back up. People around this uh, industrial park has really been helpful on repairing the caveman. Mick at Mick's Muffler, he's been a great help. He's ran the forklift and done a lot of different kind of things to help me with the caveman, so I'd like to really thank him a lot. Thanks, Mick. Uh, just, uh give him some dollies to move it around, help him flop it over when he needed and run the forklift and, and uh, done what I could. I'm John's wife and he's been working on this very hard and I think the caveman is just awesome. And I'm very proud of him. Man, we need to get that big guy back up on the pedestal here. We're going for about $4,000. We already have about $2,000 collected previously here. So really what we're doing is just trying to give it a little push today to get up to that $4,000. So call us at 476-6608. Let us know how much you can chip in. No amount, and I do mean that, absolutely no amount is too small. So let's show some oomph for UGG. Something else we want to do as part of this project is redo the... Um, the monument that stands out and tells the story of the Caveman Club and do that in rock or granite and etch the uh, Caveman Club saying into that stone. Uh, we're currently collecting uh, donations for the Caveman Club at Post Office Box 970. Just make your checks out to Oregon Caveman Club. Post Office Box 970, Grants Pass, Oregon 97528. One thing I forgot, well, in 1948, when Governor Dewey of the state of New York was running for president, he came through Grants Pass on a bus tour, Greyhound bus, and my father was a Greyhound bus driver. So the caveman asked my dad to be the bus driver while they kidnapped him. So they stopped him north of town, dad hopped in, and they took the bus driver off, and dad got behind the wheel and drove on into town. It made all the news headlines and made the wire services and even the pictures of the caveman with Dewey were published in the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union at that time you know was our dire enemy and they commented about how the poor people of Oregon were pleading their case with the presidential candidate Thomas Dewey and said this is the way real people dressed in Southern Oregon 